Well, welcome back to another edition of Walking Through the Word, where we walk verse by verse through the Word of God. Beloved, it's so good to see you here again. We haven't been in Walking Through the Word in a while, but first, before we start, I want to welcome all of our new subscribers to FGM TV. Welcome to our online family. We pray that our videos will be a blessing to you, that they will encourage you, inspire you in your faith, and that you'll grow in your walk with the Lord. And we also want to give a praise report. As of this week, beloved, you have helped us reach the target of over 1,000 subscribers. Praise the Lord. I give the Lord all the praise for his goodness and also for your subscription. Now we can reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ as YouTube pushes this video out to more people. This Sunday, I preached at LOLI Church in Sarala, Philippines. We had a wonderful outpouring service and this message that you're gonna see today is entitled, Turning Water Into Wine. I'm sure you know of the story of Jesus turning water into wine in the wedding at Cana of Galilee. There's so many divine revelations, divine truths I feel are gonna impact your life, encourage you in your walk with God and motivate you, amen, to move out with boldness and faith in the name of Jesus. So enjoy this part one. Next week we'll have part two and then we'll show you the outpouring service because there's a tangible anointing when God pours out his spirit and you can receive that anointing right there in your homes. The presence of the Lord is there to touch you. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I pray that you're blessed by these messages. And shalom. Maudie, how is everyone this evening? Praise the Lord, it's such a blessing and an honor to be able to share again this evening with you. The Lord has given me a, a wonderful message tonight that I pray that it will bless you. Would you lift your hands and pray? Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here. And I thank you for all of your beautiful children who are assembled here because they're so hungry for you, Lord. We thank you for every promise is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your love for each and every one of us. How you shower us with your mercy and your grace. And we thank you, Lord, for the promise that we have that we are going to be with you for eternity. I ask tonight that this message would encourage those who are discouraged, would strengthen the weak, and would give us excitement and motivation to pursue you with deeper intimacy than we ever had before because we are going to see you very soon. I pray this that you give revelation to your word tonight to each and every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Give Jesus a big hand of applause. God is good, all and all the time God is good. Let me get my message here. Okay. Today, the Lord gave me this message about the wedding in Cana of Galilee. I, I want you to just raise your hand if you're familiar with this story. Everyone should be familiar with the story. Just raise your hand if you know about okay, this story. Good. Because we're going to just go through these verses. There's so many prophetic parallels in this story to our Christian walk with the Lord and the process of transformation, how he changes us from glory to glory. How many of you want to be more like Jesus? Wave your hands. How many of you want more of God? Wave your hands. All right. Okay, well, this is the right the, the message today. Because this is about a wedding. Dun, dun, dun. 
I'm really doing a wedding series because the bridegroom is coming, okay? So for the next few weeks, it's just going to build because every parable is a, a biblical representation of characteristics of our Lord and characteristics of who we are in Him. So starting in John chapter 2, verse 1, would you read with me please? The third day, there was a wedding, a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. Jesus also was invited with his disciples to the marriage. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine! Jesus said to her, Woman, what does it have to do with you and me? My hour has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone set there after the Jews' way of purifying, containing two or three meters apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. They filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the ruler of the feast. So they took it. When the ruler of the feast tasted the water that now had become wine and didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the ruler of the feast called and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when the guests have drunk freely, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. And the final verse, verse 11. This beginning of signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory to his disciples, believing in him. Hallelujah. Well, you know, this tells us a lot about our bridegroom, of the, the nature and character of Jesus, because he was just like everyone. He was humble, he was ordinary, and he loved to celebrate. And he had a lot of Filipino blood as well as his Israeli blood because he loved to eat. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I think you really want to be able to bring um, and have understand the story because the Israeli people are very similar to the Filipino people. They eat all the time. They're joyful. Okay. They love to tell stories. They love to worship, and the food is la Okay, yeah. I used to live in Israel for many years. Oh, well, not many years, but at least four years. And um, one thing I noticed about this tradition that's different from ours is that pretty much people drink wine there. They're accustomed to drinking wine. Remember, the Lord compares himself as the vine dresser. Okay, and there are lots of grapes. That's one of their largest industry is grape making. So here we have this beautiful wedding. Jesus is invited to the wedding. You know, he loves weddings just like we all do. It's a joyous occasion. He brings his disciples, and there's an emergency. And this emergency was a big emergency because in the culture of Israel, if you didn't have wine. That's almost like coming to somebody's wedding and they say, Oh no! Oh no! And someone says, What? They forgot to bring the rice. <laughs> that, that's the same uh, comparison that if you had a wedding and you've been preparing for months and months and you, you catered out your wedding, you've got in this big facility and they forget to bring the rice. That is disaster. That's something that no one will ever forget. That's a disgrace of the nation. This is the same way in this culture that wine was not as seen like it is today. Most people didn't get, get very drunk then because they were used to drinking wine regularly. But not to be able to serve wine at a wedding which symbolizes great joy and a great blessing of God upon your life. If you have a lot of wine, hallelujah. That was disastrous. And he said here that the, most people, they, they drink so much in Israel at a wedding that 
they put out the good, the, the good wine first, and when everyone is kind of like dozy, then they finally put out the bad wine. And they were amazed that at this wedding that they take the best wine to last. That's just totally opposite. So wine was very important, but something about wine is, is that it has a quality of, it, 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 um, it, it's changed, you know? To make wine, there's a, there's a process of making wine. In the Old Testament, they used to take grapes and they used to, you know, stomp on the grapes. Lots of people used to get in this big basin and they would just chomp, 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 chomp and beat those grapes until the grape juice came out. Then it would go through a process of fermentation. And similar today, you all love making wine vinegar. Raise, raise your hand if you love vinegar. I mean, I, I love vinegar. I love being around Filipinos who love to make real vinegar. It's a similar process. And I did it for the first time. I said, I can't make wine, but I want to see the process of fermentation, that, that, that transformation where those grapes become real vinegar. And so I went to the store and I got myself some grapes and I put them in a bottle and poured some water in there and put some sugar and I put the top on and I was so excited to see my grapes turn into real wine vinegar that I could put on my bambus. And guess what? I waited one day and it still hadn't turned, it hadn't started bubbling, you know, getting that acidy look. And I kept on and, it's, and then I found out I had to wait 30 days. 30 days! You know, you need patience. And so this story is also talking about a process. Um, we're gonna see a process of how we have to wait on God. Now let's go through this story here. There were six water pots and they were empty water pots. And they were there for the purifying of Jews. And these water pots were, were, were humongous. Just very, very large. 20 to 30 firkins apiece. And so each water pot uh, was lots and lots of water that would, you would almost use for a whole one wedding to serve water. So these pots were empty. And the first thing was is that when the emergency came to Jesus, Jesus' mother came to him and she says, hey, we don't have any wine. And you need to make this your priority that we don't have any wine because we need wine. They, they, they don't have any wine. They want wine, but something happened and there's no wine. And Jesus remarks, he wasn't, he wasn't rude to his mother when he said, woman, what, what does this have to do with me? He really, in his tradition, it means lady. So he said, lady. You know, why are you bothering me about this? Because it's not my time yet. What Jesus was saying yet is I understand there's an emergency and I understand that I'm your son and we have a relationship between each other that whenever you need something as your son, I have to obey you. As your son, I have to honor you. As your son, I have to do what you want me to do. But now it's the beginning of my ministry. This was the first miracle of Jesus. So he was crossing from sonhood into ministry. And what he was saying to his mom was, Now, mom, you need to see me differently. You can no longer see me just as your son. You now need to see me as a man of God who has to yield to the leadings and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. What Jesus was telling his mom was, there's a time and a season for everything. Number two is I don't make that decision because of an emergency. I only do what my father is telling me to do. And this is a good example for us because in our families, we have people who know us. They, our mother, our father, our sisters and brothers are familiar with us. And when God does something in our life and when we become Christians, they still see us normally the same way they saw us before. You know, oh, this is just John. Oh, this is just, you know, Peter. This is just Joe. You know, they see us the same way. But we have to be able to differentiate the regular man from the God man, the regular sister from the God sister. We have to put God's priorities first, not just to respond to a situation because we're family. What Jesus was saying was, even though we're family, even though there's an emergency, the first thing to do is to pray and 
seek the Lord and say, is this something you want me to do? And is this the time to do it? A great revelation here in this story, how Jesus was telling her, Mama, you got to see me differently now. But he actually had compassion. He prayed. And the father said, okay, go ahead. His mom knew that he had an anointing. And so Jesus turns to the disciples and he says, fill those water pots with water. And everyone say, too big. Too big. Say it louder, too big. too big. Fill the water pots with too big. And water is a type and symbol of the Holy Spirit. And water is also for cleansing. These water pots were water pots that cleansed the Jews for their ceremonial cleansings, for their feasts. They would put their hands in there and they wash in there to clean their bodies. And why, did, why were there six water pots of stone? Those water pots are symbolic of you and me. We are those jars. We are those beautiful uh, vessels, jars. Hallelujah. Stone jars that are there. You are a vessel. And the first thing when we come to God, the first thing the Lord does is he fills us. We're, we're empty at first when we don't know him, but then number two, he fills us with the Holy Spirit, which is a type of water. Okay? Yes. So when they fill water pots. I mean, that was a lot of gallons of water just to fill one. They didn't know what it was going to do, but they obeyed. There are times in your life when you have an emergency and you run to Jesus and he may tell you something that doesn't make any sense. But from this story we must learn they had to trust God in his instructions. So they fill the water pots with water. And finally all six water pots were full. And six is a number for man. And six is the number for incompleteness. So that's how we are. We're incomplete. Man is incomplete. But even in his state, uh, six is also a number for weakness. We're weak in ourselves, But when we are filled with the person of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, we can say the weak are strong. Amen? God will make you strong. You may be originally weak, but God will make you strong and God will empower you with his Holy Spirit. And while that water was in the jars, there was a process. Say process. There was a process of fermentation. There was a process of a change, of metamorphosis. Something was happening in that water. Those, that water in the jars was actually cleansing the jars. And that's what happens when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. When we give our life to Jesus, we ask Jesus to come into our heart. The Holy Spirit comes in our heart. And the while we're loving Him and drinking of Him, He fills us. He fills us. Hallelujah. Ephesians, talking of cleansing, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loves the assembly and gave himself for it, that he may sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word. So water is this type of cleansing. So this Water is cleansing us from the inside out. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> and he said, I want you to fill them up with about 20 to 30 fergans. That's lots of gallons of water. 20 representing that it was, they were waiting. It's, it's a number for waiting. It's a number for preparation. So they're waiting for God to use them. And then they're, they're, they're trying, they're being prepared for a call. You know, when you give your life to Jesus, prophesy over you and say, oh, you're going to be a preacher like your father. You're going to be a singer like your mother. But we don't immediately go into ministry. God does not use us immediately when we give our life to Jesus. There is a number one cleansing. There is a process. 
process of transformation. And number three, there is a time of waiting. Hallelujah. There is a time of cleansing. Everyone say cleansing. Okay. So these water pots were being cleansed, and it says we are washed, we're cleansed by the water, which is the Holy Ghost, by the Word of God. How do we get cleansed so that God can use us? That water needs to be cleansed because before it could be served at the wedding feast. The Bible says we're cleansed by the Word of God. Every time you read a scripture, the Bible says that it's not just words, mere words, but God's Word is spirit and it's life. Hallelujah. It's not like a newspaper or a magazine. It, it is infused with the divine nature of God. It's infused every word, every letter with the spirit of the almighty God. The same God who said let there be light is infused with the dunamis power of God. That is why Jesus spoke his word and he said let there be light and there was light because the word of God is God. Hallelujah. Do you understand that? And so the more we read the Bible, the Spirit of God in those words, just like the water in the basins and the jars, is cleansing us and washing us. Hallelujah. So that we can be a people sanctified by the Word of God. You know, sometimes when I feel really sick, sometimes sickness will hit me. I feel very weak. After I work the day, like you, like me, we all feel weak. It's so good to be able to sit down and to open your Bible and read it as you read the words of Jesus. That word begins to strengthen you. That word begins to cleanse you. If you're ever sick, I want to encourage you to read four, five, six, seven chapters of the Bible and see what happened to the sickness. Come on. Sickness can't stay in the presence of the anointing. And so um, just symbolically this anointing was in these pots. And even though the water had not been served yet, <laughs> the anointing was going <laughs> All right. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. He wants to, he doesn't want us to have any spot or wrinkle. Amen. Okay. Stage two, the second stage of our transformation is in feeling. And I said that Jesus instructs us to be filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, Returned from the Jordan, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Acts chapter 2 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. And finally, Ephesians chapter 5 18. The Bible encourages us, beloved, don't be drunk with wine, which is a dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Turn your neighbor and ask them, is your water pot filled to the top? Is your water pot filled to the top? That water is the type of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says in this hour, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what it means is, it goes on to tell us in, John, uh, in the book of Acts chapter 2, that being filled with the Holy Spirit has a demonstration that on the day of Pentecost, when they were really filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. They began to speak in the language of God. They were so full, they were bubbling over. I remember when I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit many years ago, and the Lord filled my water pot with water. Hallelujah. It started bubbling all over the place. I started speaking in other tongues, and I didn't even want tongues. Some people just started praying for me and said, Gee, God has a gift for you. I said, Really? And they said, Yeah, can we pray for you? And I said, If it's tongues, I don't want any part of it. Because my uh, Baptist church 
my father was a pastor, and they told me that tongues was from the devil. And I believed that for many years. So I told these uh, leaders from this organization, please don't pray for me. I don't want it because I believe tongues is from the devil. I wanted to be filled with God's spirit so it, the, his spirit would overflow. But I was afraid. But they said, please, let, let us just pray for you. We think God will bless you. So one lady took her hand on the left. She could be, she could be, she could be. And the other lady put her hand to the right and touched me. She could be, she They started praying in tongues. And I said, didn't I tell you not to pray in that language? And they said, excuse me. You said you don't want to speak in tongues. You didn't say we could not speak in tongues. So I said, okay, you can speak, but I don't want to speak. And as I began to speak in other tongues, all my pain, all my shame, all my fears and emptiness began to come up as the Holy Spirit was healing me, releasing me. Oh, I just started to feel the love of God flowing up out of me like a well of water. Yeah. And I started speaking in tongues. She got a lot of Because you're not filled with the power of God. How many of you want power? Raise your hands. <laughs> All right. And so, those pots were filled. Now they're waiting. We don't know how long that water was waiting in the pot. Or how many hours when they were dancing? <laughs> Before they were given another commandment by Jesus to take the water and begin to serve the water. Can you imagine you being there? Suppose you were the porter and you heard. Jesus had said all of the porters here in this restaurant, you know it's water. Take the water and give it to the president of the banquet. In those days, there was like a president of the banquet. It represents the top guy. You know, you have the Holy Spirit in you, and we're kind of shy, you know. Maybe you want to pray for someone. You want to, you, you're not going to go to Marcos. You're not going to go to President Marcos and say, I want to practice on you. Please, can I pray for you? You're going to start with your mommy and your cousins and somebody who's in your same sphere of influence. You're not going to go to the city council. You're not going to go to the Morongai captain and say, excuse me, I want to see if God is going to give us a miracle. We've been believing this water is going to turn wine. Would you drink it, Barangay captain, and tell me? <laughs> but that symbolizes that God does not want us to limit his ability. He says, go to the top. I said, go to the top. Go to the top. Go to the top guy. He said, I want you to serve this water to the top. And the president of this banquet and let them taste it first. Give it to the top and then let it come down to the bottom. My spiritual mom used to do that when she used to go to another country. She didn't just go to the missionaries. She didn't just go to the churches. She said, take me to the king. 